Good to know. Welcome to being a two-party consent state, Joshua. Yeah, we are too. All right. For everyone logging in, we are just getting our live streams going. And we are live on Facebook and on Zoom. So for everyone who's joining us, my name is Josh Gilliland. I'm the chair of the C-Scout Marketing Committee. And we're gonna have a gangbusters time tonight because I love Rules of the Road. Now granted, I'm a little funny that way, uh, but it is the intersection of how to safely handle your vessel and knowing the interplay with, between other vessels uh, that are on the water with you. It's literally the rules of the road, except we're on the water. I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Bruce Johnson now, who's our liaison with the Coast Guard Auxiliary, member of the National Sea Scout Committee, and let him take it from here. Bruce. Thanks very much, Josh. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our monthly Coast Guard Tech Talks workshop. These workshops are jointly sponsored by the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts of America's Sea Scout program. My name is Bruce Johnson, and I serve as chief of the Coast Guard Auxiliary's youth programs. Our co-host, as you've already met, is Josh Gilliland. Uh, Josh will be coordinating your questions in the third part of the program. Coast Guard Tech Talks are held on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 2100 Eastern, 2000 Central, and so on. Each program focuses on a single science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM topic. These topics are chosen to support the Sea Scout Advancement Program. Next month's Tech Talks workshop will be on electricity, which is a Sea Scout Level 3 Advancement Elective. Tonight's topic is navigation rules. And before I uh, turn you over to our presenter, I wanted to just share with you a couple of things that as you're learning the rules of the road, you need to be aware of. This very attractive publication is the uh, rule, uh, navigation rules published by the Coast Guard. You can either go to your local marine supply store or you can uh, download it for free off the web. Uh, this is a great way to uh, learn the rules of the road by going through kind of a flashcard uh, scenario. I, I really love this for reviewing rules of the road. And then Weems and Plath makes what amounts to a slide rule of different uh, rules of the road scenarios. So that's another way to study and prepare for your NAVRILS tests. Um, our speaker tonight and also organizer of Coast Guard Tech Talks is Lieutenant John DeCastra of the Coast Guard. JD is a Coast Guard rotary, ring, rotary wing aviator stationed at Air Station Atlantic City, New Jersey. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Auburn University, where he also began his Coast Guard career in the Auxiliary University program and has been a Coast Guard Auxiliarist as well since 2010. JD also serves as the chief of the Auxiliary Youth Program STEM training branch. So for uh, just as a housekeeping thing, we've muted your microphones to make it easier for everyone to hear. If you have questions, type them into the Q&A box uh, or the chat box and Josh and I will be monitoring the chat, chat and we'll be sure to leave some time to answer your questions. So let's welcome JD to Castra. Excellent, welcome. Uh, so you might be thinking, what is an aviator doing talking about rules of the road? Well, prior to being an aviator, I was aboard two ships um, and I hold uh, or held at one point two underway OD qualifications. So I'm familiar with the rules of the road and they can be a beast. Um, and without, I'm gonna do one thing real quick prior to jumping into this. Um, Bruce spoke about being able to download the rules of the road from the web. And I just wanted to point out 
that is from the Coast Guard's Navigation Center. Uh, and from here, you can actually download the most current PDF version of that. And with that, since this is such a beast, we're going to jump right into this um, and continue on our get into it because I will probably be hard pressed to make my 30 minutes. All right, so the PowerPoint I'm going to be working off of is from the Auxiliaries Seamanship course. I edited a little bit to fit into the criteria of this webinar. Um, study materials we kind of already talked about. The main thing is the link to the Nav Navigation Center's website is right down here for future reference. Um, jumping into it, so how the rules of the road are broken down. They're broken down into different sections and subsections. The way I kind of like to think about this, at least in my mind, is you have a square and a rectangle. A rect or square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. Certain things apply to every situation, and then as it, you get more specific, they narrow down further and further. So when you're applying the rules of the road, you need to be very clear about what specific scenario am I applying this to? Because a overtaking situation is different than a narrow channel situation. And you're going to act differently according which, according to which you're in, even though you might appear to be in a crossing or an overtaking situation in narrow channels, but which one trumps what? And that's kind of how this goes down. So you can see this is a the table of contents from the actual rules of the road. You have your general application, which applies to everything in the rules of the road. <clears throat> and we're gonna get into rule number two, which in my opinion is one of the most important. From there, you're gonna get into your steering and sailing rules, your conduct of any vessels in any condition or in any visibility. And then you're gonna get into vessels inside of one another. So these are gonna be your most applicable or your most broad. These are gonna be more specific. And then you get into the very specific of restricted ability, ability to maneuver or your RAM vessels. Then you're going to get into your lights and shapes as well as your sound signals. And to be honest, the best thing with your lights, shapes, and sound signals is rote memorization. And that's where the, the flashcards are going to come into play. So we're not going to touch a lot on those today. We're going to focus mainly on these up here. All right, so let's get down into it. All right, what does coal regs mean? Coal regs is a, an abbreviation for collision regulations. 72 is simply the year in which they were instituted. And we have two types of coal regs. We have international and we have inland. When you look at the, the, the actual book, if you get the printed out book, on the left side is inland and on the right side is international. And I might've had those flip flopped. Um, one side is inland, one side is international. If memory serves correctly, it's the left and the right. Um, and where those differentiate is going to be your Colreg's line of demarcation. Uh, also, it's charted on your chart as either a demarcation line, and we always referenced, referenced it as your Colreg's line. So in our navigations brief, we would state, hey, at this point, we are crossing with the Colreg's line, which means we are switching from inland rules to international rules. There's not much, there is some difference, and it's mostly in the verbiage. So you do need to pay attention to which rules you're actually operating in, either your inland or your international. <clears throat> and <clears throat> continuing on from there, um, all right, we're going to jump into rule number two. So essentially, the coal regs, what we just talked about, is rule number one, where it talks about who has the authority to do it. In the United States, that authority rests with the Secretary of the United States Coast Guard. So in our current political setup, it's the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. And then for inland specific rules, when you're talking about the international rules, the book just specifies the government controlling that specific area you're in. So the international rules are done by international treaty, whereas the inland rules are done by nation specific laws. Okay, so now we're going to get into rule number two, which is responsibility. And this is the most important rule, also known as the rule of good and prudent seamanship. There's a whole lot of legal verbiage in it. But the summation of the rule is what would a good and prudent seaman do? That is what you are required to do. If you were to take seven 
prudent seamen sit them in a room and say, what would you do in situation Y or X? They will all give roughly the same scenario and that general consensus is what you're going to do. Now, why is this very important? What this rule is saying is you are always responsible for your actions. If you get in a collision at sea, whether you are the stand-on vessel or the giveaway vessel, you are at fault. It does not matter what the other vessel did, you are to blame. How much of that blame? Well, that's what admiralty law is for, um, as this states down here. So your admiralty lawyers are simply there to say, okay, you were a part of a collision. We know you're guilty because you had a collision. How much guilt do you bear for this? Are you going to go to jail for murder if someone died or are you just gonna get a slap on the wrist? And it's, it's all gonna be settled out by the courts. But rule number two, in my opinion, and it is strictly my opinion, is the most important rule to understand that no matter what you are doing, you are responsible for avoiding collision at sea. <clears throat> um, and then there are different special circumstances too. So the rules can only specify certain amount of things. You can only write so much on paper. And in reality, there's an infinite number of possibilities and solutions. Case in point, the rules are always written for two vessels, but the vast majority of times you're dealing with three or more vessels on a routine basis, whether it's via radar contacts, whether you have multiple site visual contacts. And so this is where you have to come back and apply your rule of good and prudent seamanship as to how you're going to deal with those special circumstances, applying the rules. And before we get into more of them, <clears throat> I'm gonna go over two specific and very important definitions, shall and should. Shall is a command. If you see something that says shall, you have no obligation to do anything. Let me rephrase that. Your only obligation is you must do what it says. If it says you shall, alter course to starboard, you will alter your course to starboard. No if, ands, or buts. If it said should, eh, you can do it. You cannot do it. It's really up to you. And another word that's quote, uh, occasionally thrown in there is may. May is an equivalent of should. You may do something, you should do something. And that'll come into play in rule 17 once we get down there. <clears throat> okay, so now we're getting into rule five. And some of the rules I'm, I'm skipping out, uh, which are more application specific, not a whole lot of meat and potatoes to them and not very applicable for the short time frame in which I have. So we're getting into rule five, which is lookout. Every vessel shall at all points in time maintain an adequate lookout. And in foul weather, you should have more lookout. What that means is it is should be the sole job of one person to be searching for contacts. <clears throat> and if you get into a collision, well, guess what? Your lookout was improper because you should have known there was something there and avoided it. Okay, rule number two, safe speed. Safe speed is very subjective in some ways and very specific in other ways. There's different things in which you have to consider in terms of safe speed, visibility, traffic, your vessel's maneuverability, the weather situation, your winds, your seas, your currents. So if you're in a 25 foot Boston whaler or a very maneuverable vessel, you're safe in a clear, beautiful day with flat seas, your safe speed might be fairly fast, 20, 30 knots. Weather starts rolling in, now your visibility is reduced to one nautical mile, guess what? Your safe speed is no longer 20 to 35 knots. <clears throat> when you get into the sound signal portion of it, it talks about not being, or it talks about being able to outrun your sound signal. That also plays into safe speed. If your vessel is not very maneuverable, it has a very wide turn radius, you're not going to be one of, you will not want to be cruising around at sufficiently high speeds when there's a whole bunch of small boat traffic around. And this all comes down to the good and prudent seamanship, your judgment. You're the captain of your vessel. You know how it operates. You are therefore responsible for knowing, being able to apply all these different considerations in making a judgment call on what is your safe speed. 
Okay, next is going to be risk of collision. <clears throat> this touches on a few things, but the biggest thing to take away from this, if there is ever any doubt that there is a risk of collision, there is a risk of collision. This also talks about your constant range decreasing bearing. If you have a contact that's 45 degrees off your starboard bow at five nautical miles, 10 minutes later, it's still 45 degrees off your starboard bow at four nautical miles. Congratulations, you now have constant bearing decreasing range. You have a risk of collision. You now have to take action. Um, but once again, the biggest thing here is if there's ever, ever any doubt that there is a risk of collision, there is a risk of collision. <clears throat> Next is going to be rule eight, your action to avoid collision. So further down into the rules, it goes into the more specifics about the give way and the stand on vessel, which we'll get into more detail later. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, but the specifics to rule number eight is you have to have positive and ample time and that the course of action in which you take has to be noticeable to the other vessel. So kind of what does that mean? If you are in a crossing situation and you're the stand on vessel and you need to alter your course, don't alter your course two to three degrees. Make a big alteration where it is clearly evident that you are moving, make a course correction of 20 degrees. So the other vessels all know, okay, he is actually coming to starboard to avoid this collision. <clears throat> and then there are times where a course change won't, won't suffice. You might have to reduce speed. You might have to back down entirely, depending upon how close that is. Okay, so now we're going to get into more of the specifics. So we're going to go over our head-on situations, our crossing, and our overtaking. And by head-on, meeting situations uh, is, is what this PowerPoint uses. So meeting is going to be a bow to bow. Crossing is going to be a close to perpendicular or at some angle. And then an overtaking is going to be as I am coming up. And there are specific points at which this is going to be. For example, the overtaking is two points abaft to beam. If you are two points abaft to the beam, you're overtaking and you're not in a crossing situation. So let's get into a little more of these. So there are meetings. Um, the head-on situations is going to be, we have can pass port to port. One vessel or both vessels are gonna pass on the port side. You can do starboard to starboard. And I came a little too quickly. Um, and this is all going to be hashed out either via sound signals or over the radio. Even if you're doing over the radio, everyone still uses the sound signals. Ed, come up channel 13, bridge to bridge, motor vessel so-and-so, this is motor vessel so-and-so. Uh, we'll see on two whistles, starboard to starboard. Roger that, Captain, two whistles. Um, and then you still have the actual horn to do it with. <clears throat> Next is going to be your overtaking vessel. In this situation, the, over, the vessel which is doing the overtaking is your giveaway vessel, and it is their responsibility to get out of the other vessel's way. So this green vessel right here is being overtaken by the red vessel. Therefore, the red vessel has to alter its course to not collide with the green vessel. Okay, once again, here's meeting. <clears throat> um, so in these situations up here, it would be as if there were no risk of collision during the meeting, but you would still want to agree to what the passing is, come up the maritime or the bridge to bridge communication and do your sound signals. If there is risk of collision for the meeting, you still do your sound signals. And in most cases, it's gonna be come to starboard. You can still come to port, if it is previously agreed upon, but the standard is come to starboard. Okay, so this is gonna be a crossing situation. Oh, wow, that PowerPoint moves. I did not know that when I was going through this. Um, so the crossing situation is the red vessel, once again, is going to be your stand on or your giveaway vessel. The way I like to think of it 
is at night, what light would I show? So in this case, the give wave, the stand on vessel, you are seeing its port light, which is a red light, which to me says, okay, that vessel has to stop. So now I have to get out of that vessel's way. Whereas this vessel is going to see the give way vessels green light or their starboard running light, meaning they're clear to keep on trucking. Um, <clears throat> so the vessel to the right is going to have the right of way. And keep in mind, this is going to be for vessels of like class which we're going to get into later on, which is going to be two power driven vessels. Um, sailing vessels gets a little more complicated. So we're gonna keep it specifically to two power driven vessels. In this case, the give way vessel is going to alter their course to starboard, not to port, to starboard as the animation shown. You, for the rules of the road, always come to starboard. If you're going to port, high likelihood you are wrong. Starboard is the way to go. <clears throat> this talks about the danger zone of a vessel and it's going to extend from dead ahead to about two, point, two points abaft to beam. And if you are in the stand or if you are in the danger zone of that vessel, it's not a good day. That's when you're gonna get into your shall may shall and both vessels are gonna to have to start maneuvering to actually get out of there. Moral of the story, you don't wanna be in here to the point to where there is a large risk of collision. You should be making course alterations before getting close into this danger zone. <clears throat> okay, so now we're getting into the responsibilities of the give way vessel, which is rule 16. This statement right here where it's talking about there is no such thing as a right of way, only a stand on vessel in a give way alludes to once again, rule number two, a good and prudent seamanship. You don't necessarily have the right of way or the stand on vessel doesn't necessarily have the right of way. They're just supposed to maintain their course and speed. Whereas the give way vessel, it is your responsibility to take substantial and early action to avoid that collision. So in this picture right here, we have a crossing situation. This vessel is a give way vessel. You can see that this vessel is to the starboard, or the, I'm sorry, the stand on vessel is to the starboard of the give way vessel, seeing its red, red running light, meaning that, okay, I am now the give way vessel, I have to do something. Whereas the stand on vessel is, oh, I see green, I'm clear to maintain my course and speed. <clears throat> now, actions of a stand-on vessel. <clears throat> this is going to get into what I like to call the shall may shall rule. A stand-on vessel shall maintain its course and speed. It may alter its speed if necessary. And if risk of collision is evident or is impossible with a, let me rephrase how that's said. If collision will happen, if I'm tripping over my words, <laughs> the last shall is going to mean if collision is imminent and the stand on vessel has to alter course or speed, now it's a shall. If collision is imminent, the stand on vessel shall maintain course and speed to prevent a collision and avoid altering course to port. So what does that mean? We're gonna come back up here to give a pictorial example. Say this give way vessel did not do anything. It maintained its course and speed to the point of where it got into the very close up into the danger zone and had no one done anything, they, the two boats would have collided. Well, now the stand on vessel, well, first of all, prior to getting to that point, the stand-on vessel should be noticing, hey, this giveaway vessel is not doing anything. All right, let me slow down a little bit. Let them know, okay, give them an opportunity to react. Maybe they didn't see me. <clears throat> Maybe they're busy with something and they will continue to do the right thing and come to starboard. A little bit of time elapses. Okay, that's not happening. I now have to do something or I will collide. It is now the stand on vessels obligation. They shall alter course and speed, avoid coming to port. Now, why do you wanna avoid coming to port? 
Say, for example, they get close. Well, what's the giveaway vessel going to do? The giveaway vessel is going to want to come to starboard. And if you're the stand-on vessel and you come to port, right at, say, for example, right after you come to port, the giveaway vessel is like, oh, crap, I'm about to hit someone. Let me come to starboard because that's what I'm supposed to do. You just came to port. Now this giveaway vessel is going to starboard. And guess what? Risk of collision is still existing. And now there's even less time to react or course or correct that action. So when you when the stand on vessel is in that final shall where you shall take corrective action, always come to starboard. Coming to starboard is going to if that giveaway vessel sees what's happening and they do the right thing coming to starboard, you still avoid collision. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to get into the specific definitions of power driven vessels. So a power-driven vessel is something which is propelled by machinery. A sailboat, guess what, can be a power-driven vessel. If the sailboat is not under sail, it's a power-driven vessel. You have underway, which means it's not anchored or fast to shore. <clears throat> you have a sailing vessel, meaning it is propelled, propelled by sails only. Even if you have your sails up, but the engine is running, providing power or thrust to the boat, Congratulations, you are now a power-driven vessel and you have to abide by those rules. <clears throat> um, all right, talk about power-driven vessels. All right, another one is gonna be not under command. Not under command is one of my favorite ones because at least in my experience, everyone has misunderstood what this definition is. Not under command, or what, typically what I've seen is not under command means, oh, the captain's incapacitated some way or another. No, 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 no. What not under command means is that vessel cannot maneuver. Typically, it's going to be some type of steering malfunction. If your rudder goes out, well, now you are a vessel not under command. No matter what happens, you can do nothing but either maintain your course and maintain your course, possibly maintain your or change your speed, or you're just sitting there. Next is going to be restricted in ability to maneuver. That is going to be vessels which are doing some type of work. So when a ship is doing helicopter operations, that vessel is now restricted in their ability to maneuver because they have to maintain a course and speed for the helicopter. If you are laying underground cable, well, guess what? You're restricted in your ability to maneuver. You have to go that course and speed and you, you cannot easily get out of each other's way. Then it's gonna be constrained by draft. At sea, this isn't really a whole lot. The closer into shore you get, this is where this is going to come into effect, particularly coming to and leaving ports if you're outside of a narrow channel because that's gonna be a whole different animal. And what this means is, hey, my draft is 40 feet. I only have 30 feet of water off to my port or off to my starboard. I can't go that way. Now I'm constrained by my draft. You're going to have fishing vessels and coupled in with fishing vessels are also trawling. Fishing and trawling are pretty much one and the same when it comes to the classes of vessels. Then you're going to have your sailboats, your power boats, your submarines, hovercrafts, and seaplanes. Now, if you will notice, the way these worked were your least maneuverable, the further down you got are going to be your most maneuverable. And a good acronym to remember this is new reels catch fish, so purchase some. There's a whole lot out there. Um, I like this one personally because I like to fish. And how does this apply? What does this mean? So as a power boat, I pretty much have to give way to anyone. If I come across a sailboat, guess what? The sailboat is less maneuverable than I am. Therefore, I have to give way regardless of whether I am in a crossing or a head-on situation or no matter what the situation is. If I am a fishing vessel, well, guess what? Now the sailboat has to give way to me. If I am a vessel which is not under command, Besides the fact that I have a marine casualty, which I'm probably combating, every vessel has to stay out of my way regardless of the situation. Now, there is a catch to these seven classes of vessels. And I'm going to come back up to the table of contents to let you know. So these classes of vessels do not apply under certain rules. 
in particular, your narrow channels and your traffic separation schemes. If you are in a narrows channel rule, congratulations, and you're a sailboat passing a container vessel, congratulations, you're now operating under narrow channels, the narrow channels rule, and that thousand foot cargo vessel transiting that channel has the right of way despite it being a power vessel and you being a sailing boat under sail. So this is where that rectangle square type dichotomy comes into play. Just because the responsibilities between vessels in the overtaking and head-on situations may exist, you might not necessarily be applicable to that if you're in a narrow channel. So you need, when going through these, you need to make sure you know, okay, this is the specific rule in which I operate in. If I am operating in this specific area, these are the other criteria in which I have to abide by. <clears throat> and we are at 30 minutes. Let's see if I have missed anything prior to getting into questions. <clears throat> I think I got through the majority of what I wanted to. Um, once again, I'm not gonna be getting into lights so much. Uh, know them that they are there, lights are important. And when you're looking at a picture, or a, when you're looking at a picture of lights, chances are that's not what it's actually going to look like in reality. Most vessels have some type of deck light on the vast majority of the time. And just be, and those deck lights are very bright and tend to drown out your running lights. In particular, your port light. Port lights, for some reason, are in my opinion the hardest to find, are to spot, especially when you have your yellow deck lights up and running. Um, once again, still more lights. So, like for example, this right here. In reality, you will not see this. This fishing vessel or this trawler is going to have so many deck lights on that these lights will be very hard to tell what they are and where they're going. So just keep that in mind. And that's where a lot of your radar systems, if you have them, are gonna come into play to be able to pick up that track and figure out where it's going. Um, sound signals, I'm not gonna get into a whole lot either because once again, that's just rote memorization. Um, but they are important and they are still used, uh, particularly if you're operating around a lot of vessels which don't necessarily have maritime radios, sound signals are a great way if you don't have channel 13 up. One short, two short, um, or five if uh, you have danger. So the important ones are the most important in my opinion is five or more short blast. That's danger. If you hear that, look around, see what's going on, and make sure you're not about to hit someone or someone is about to hit you. <clears throat> um, day shapes we're not gonna get into. Um, once again, rope memorization. You just get your flashcards out, figure out what they are. They're massive black diamonds or balls. Very easy to see. Um, and then... I think the rest of this are just examples of lights. So with that, let's open it up to questions. Thank you. Always fun to get into crossing situations and uh, teaching Sea Scouts when underway, steer where the other vessel has been, not where they're going to avoid situations or uh, if you were anchored and someone was on a sailboat you know, sailing right towards you and they yell at you to move despite the fact you're anchored, those things happen. And being able to point to an anchor ball and say, we're anchored, go ahead and ram us. And uh, again, just, just those fun, fun stories. Now, uh, one of my most favorite ones is when I'm doing helicopter operations with the small boat. Occasionally, other vessels won't, won't get out of the way and they'll come up very close. And what I love to do is I love to get up channel 16 and be like, uh, hey, Coast Guard uh, 47, whatever, this Coast Guard helicopter, do you need us to back off while you board the boat? 
and cite him for a Navarro's violation. And very quickly, you'll see the boat turn around. <laughs> Oops. Uh, fun with the rules. Now, we do have uh, at least one question, and I'm sure others are going to be typing it, typing them in as we go. Uh, but one that came in in chat is uh, whether a fishing vessel, is fishing vessel only trawlers with nets, or does that include anyone with a fishing rod? And have at it, because this... Sorry, but uh, no, it does not include anyone with the fishing rod. Those are specifically your, your commercial guys who are trawling nets or trawling long lines out the back of the boat. Um, if you're just going after tuna, congratulations, you are a power-driven vessel. Yeah, think deadliest catch, sword fishermen, all that stuff, uh, commercial fishing operations. Uh, but that's a that's a widely misunderstood rule. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been out in my sailboat and have had a runabout power up one side of my boat, cross in front of it, and they're trailing fishing lines, and they don't understand that with my sails up, I'm not going to alter course to avoid their fishing lines. So here's a fun one. Do the NAV rules apply? to me, even if I have a small boat. It's just Josh on his kayak cruising Lake or uh, Tahoe, which is between two states. So there's Coast Guard base there. As in like a small John boat or just like a canoe, a kayak? Small boat, small boat. Let's say my dreams have come true and I got a uh, Norded tug and I have that. Uh, 29 footer on Lake Tahoe. But... Yes, uh, so on Lake Tahoe, Bruce, you might be able to correct me on this one, but I, I do know that even on state waters, you should still use them. The legal application behind them, I honestly am not entirely sure of because I've never operated on those specific environments. Um, it's between two states, so the... the right. well, federal, yes, absolutely. If it's a federal waterway, 100%, they still apply. Um, and my guess would be even in state specific waters, they do. But once again, I, I can't attest to the legality of that. Um, however, it's still a good idea to abide by them because they work. So <clears throat> as a litigator, I, I have a strong answer on this one, but uh, what is the most important rule? And I'm curious to hear your answer on what is the most important NAV rule? Mine is rule number two. Uh, good and prudent seamanship, because it is the catch-all, cover your own butt of regardless of what happens, I'm on the line, and it's my responsibility to not end up in court or end up in a collision at the bottom of the sea or dead. So I go with avoid risk of collision, but it's still for the same intent. Mm -hmm. So that is fascinating. Uh, now, can I get ticketed for a failure to obey the NAV rules? Yes. Um, the most likely case and where that would fall under is negligent operations. Um, so as a, as a mariner, even if you're on a small boat, you are still required to operate a vessel in a safe manner. Failure to do so is negligent operations. If you get cited multiple times for the same violations, or there are other mitigating circumstances that can be bumped up to gross negligence, which then means your vessel is going to be terminated and you're gonna end up in court. If it's just negligent operations, it's like a speeding ticket. If it's gross negligent operations, that's at the same level as like a BUI or a DUI. And those are different levels. <laughs> so uh, how are legal cases decided for NAVRO violations? And let's just say I am not one of those lawyers. No. So, um, so it kind of goes back to the slides of you are at fault. Uh, the court case is not necessarily to determine your guilt or innocence. It is to determine how much of the responsibility you bear. And that is going to be an admiralty lawyer. There are specific schools throughout the, the, the nation that specialize in admiralty law. Uh, don't ask me what any of them are because I don't know any of them off the top of my head, but it is a very specific subset of law. And from my understanding, you can stand to make a lot of good money 
um, doing that type of law because shipping companies will pay top dollar for you. It's uh, it's exclusively federal, so it's not a, shouldn't be appearing in state court because it all goes to federal court. And uh, I do know in places like um, you know, Base Alameda, you know, you have the administrative law judge uh, who's there uh, hearing at multi cases. So it's a very special area. Uh, I'm not sure what law schools are the ones that focus on it. Uh, where I went did not. And uh, I've read some cases. And again, it's deep dive into a very specific uh, type of jurisprudence. Uh, we do have a chat message about rule not, uh, covering uh, sound signals for restricted visibility. Uh, and my reaction to that is stay tuned. That's, there's, that's a, there's no way to cover all of this in one evening. So that will, that, that needs to be its own special uh, webinar where we talk about when you're gonna hear a gong. Uh, but the general mm -hmm. rule of thumb is if you hear a gong, stay away. You don't, don't wanna go find that lesson. With, with sound signals for restricted invisibility, some of the big things are, one, they are very, very annoying. When you are standing a four hour bridge watch and that whistle goes off every minute or two, it is very tiresome and very tedious and it will wear you down. <clears throat> um, and then one of the biggest thing with it is I kind of touched on it and safe speed, do not outrun your sound signal because that is a big thing. Um, if you're going 20 knots, and your sound signal can only go 2,000 yards, well, guess what? In two minutes, you're going to be going more than 2,000 yards, and you might as well not even be doing a sound signal. Um, but your vast majority of those for your power-driven vessels are going to be, uh, I'm not even going to say what they are because I'm going to butcher it, but I believe it's one short blast every two minutes. Um, but don't quote me on that because without looking at it, I don't actually want to say what it is. But the biggest thing, don't outrun them. And they're very annoying. If in doubt, the, the sound signal would be one prolonged and one short. That, that uh, communicates uh, a bunch of different uh, meanings, all of which basically get down to uh, watch out. We can... Um, I was going to mention a question that when I teach this, that comes up pretty frequently. Um, and it has to do with the concept of right of way. Uh, everybody is familiar with the, uh, with right of way in driving. And they just assume that right of way carries the same meaning uh, in the navigation rules. And so the question is, when do I have the right of way? Never. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. There is one situation where you do have the right of way. If you are an unpowered barge downbound on the Western River system, because um, they don't have brakes. And so they flow with the, the flow of the river. And so they have the right of way. But if you're just out on the Chesapeake Bay or the San Francisco Bay, you do not have the right of way. You may be the stand on vessel, but that doesn't mean that you have the right of way. I've seen lots of instances where sailboats will sail in front of one of the big container ships coming up the bay, figuring, well, they're a power vessel and I'm a sailboat, so they have to get out of my way. And uh, quite apart from the rules that you cited, uh, JD, there's uh, a rule that isn't in the navigation rules, and that's the rule of gross tonnage, yes. which is, and, and this is not, not a legitimate rule, but it's a common sense rule. If you get into a collision with the other vessel, um, will you survive that collision? Um, in all likelihood, if you run in front of a container ship going up the bay, they will have no idea that they ran over you. And the first clue that they will have that they, that they sunk you was that you scraped off some of the rust off the side of the boat. So just don't, don't take chances, go behind them. So 
how about let's talk practical. Let's just say that it's um, we're going on a Sea Scout cruise. We're northbound in the San Bruno Shoal Channel. We're coming up on uh, Yerba Buena Island. And all of a sudden around Treasure Island, we see a swarm of sailboats doing a regatta. And we're a powerboat. And there's now 36 sailboats all over the place. Who has right away? That's going to be one of those special circumstances where me personally, if I can go around them, I'm going to go around them and avoid it all together. Don't even put yourself in those situations. Yes. Now, if, now, if you are a big cargo vessel where you have to be in that channel, well, now you're operating under the narrow channels and sorry, sailing vessel of regattas, get out of the way or you're going to be bugged on a windshield. Yeah, but they shouldn't be holding the regatta in the middle of a uh, dredged channel. <laughs> Touche. Um, so again, there's lots of fun that we can have with this, and we will revisit rules of the road, uh, you know, and work in polling questions or a cahoot so that way it could be more participatory and being able to have questions come up and get audience participation on what's the right answer here and in this crossing situation or overtaking or what does this light mean? Um, because it's, this is the nuts and bolts of getting on the water, being able to know, is this safe? Or if we've anchored someplace, what do you then need to do? So there's lots of uh, great ways to keep the sea promise to guard against water accidents. And this is a big one. It's, um, we haven't really gotten into uh, the meaning of lights, but there are a couple of uh, warnings, cautionary notes that you need to be keep in mind. One is that not all boats are showing the right lights. It's not uncommon for a boat to have a light that they're required to show and that light is either burnt out or they've stowed some equipment in front of the light and you can't see it. So you can't totally trust that the lights that you're seeing are an accurate, accurate uh, depiction of what is really going on around you. The other one is that for many of us, we operate our boats in an urban environment and there are lots of uh, city lights in the background and that have a, has a tendency to obscure uh, the meaning of lights and it also can really confuse things. Uh, one time I was going up a channel and I thought I knew where I was and all of a sudden the green light, uh, no it was the red light turned green. Now uh, the reason for that, I thought it was a buoy well, it turns out it was a traffic light that was on the shore. And uh, of course, what do you do in a situation like that? You make a 180 degree turn and go back the way you were and figure out where you really are and not where you thought you were. There was actually a accident, a major marine accident. I want to say it was around the Boston area where there was a cargo vessel who ran into some, some shoal water, partly because of that, that one issue. It was also coupled with their GPS wasn't actually giving them a nav solution and it was dead reckoning, coupled with the channel lights blending into the, the shore lights and they went ran right up into the shoal water and spilled a whole bunch of oil. And the uh, risk management uh, case study that we were teaching last year uh, for the Coast Guard involved uh, a collision into a, a jetty. And uh, what caused that was they weren't where they thought they were. And they misread the city lights uh, to mean something else about the channel. And of course, the big problem was that they were operating after dark in near to total darkness, except for uh, the uh, city lights and of course the navigation lights on the buoys. And 
they were operating at 35 knots when they really should have been operating at more like five to 10 knots, but they were anxious to get to where they were go wanted to go and tragedy ensued and there were some people who are badly hurt because of it. So that gets back to the point JD was making about operating at a safe speed. That's especially important when you're not certain of where you are. Well, with that, we've covered all the questions. We one last thing, just real quick, for anyone who is interested in a lot more about Rules of the Road, I highly recommend Farwell's Rules of the Road. It goes, it's a very thick book, and it goes into case studies and the Admiralty Law studies of all the specifics of the Rules of the Road. It's a great way to take the actual rules up to the next notch and actually learn to, to comprehend and understand them very well. It's, it's a very boring read. It will put you to sleep, but it is a very good one. Um, looking on Amazon now. So that sounds, <laughs> as a lawyer, that sounds really interesting. So with that, uh, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we have uh, webinars in June. Uh, we're, we'll probably have two in one week with uh, our uh, Coast Guard Tech Talk and a sailing racing webinar as well. So it's going to be a lot of fun uh, in June. So with that, everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you all very soon. Thank you, JD. Thank you.